Good morning, everybody. Um, morning. For some of you, it might not be morning. Um, so good afternoon, if if it's uh, afternoon where you are, but we're happy to have you here. Um, uh, if you don't know me, my name is TJ Tatro. Let me share the screen. Am I sharing the right one? No. Let me share the correct screen. Okay. Um, so my name is TJ Tatro. Um, I've done a couple of these webinars, but clearly I can't master the screen sharing. Uh, I'm joined by my colleague and my boss, the scientific director, uh, Dr. Susan Tappan. Sue, how are you doing this morning? <laughs> it, it feels like a Monday, but I'm happy to be here. Um, so let's get it going. It's so weird to be in the office. It's the first time I've been in the office in months, but uh, I thought maybe having a little dedicated time where my children couldn't interrupt me might be good for my soul. So hopefully this goes well. Hopefully, fingers crossed. Um, so today, uh, during our allotted time, we want to talk about some of the newest features we've added to Neuralucida 360, and specifically this version, version 2020.3.1. Um, as many of you know, Neuralucida 360 is specifically designed to detect and reconstruct processes within neuronal structures. And we also have the, the partnering program, Neuralucida Explorer, and that's specifically designed to extrapolate uh, quantitative data from the reconstructions that we've done in Neuralucida 360. So before we get started started, we wanna just go over a couple of quick things. Um, the webinar is being recorded, so if you would like to see this later, um, there will be a link available that will be sent to you. Um, if you want a certificate of completion, that is also possible. We Just let us know in the survey and we can send that to you as well after the webinar is completed. Um, probably most importantly, the key to a successful webinar is you guys. Um, we, we love hearing from you. It's, it's really helpful to hear uh, your questions and comments as we go. So if you do have a question that pops into your head as we're going through this webinar, um, please refer to this, I guess. Um, there's a red, an orange arrow to kind of expand the screen. You just need to find this question panel and then type it in. That's all it is. Once you hit enter, it'll be visible to us. And if we don't see it right away, that's all right. We're going to try and get through as many of these questions as we can, as we present. Um, and then hopefully at the end, we'll have some time for a little question and answer as well. Again, before we start, there are a couple of other things we want to address. Um, the coronavirus, as we know, this has changed day to day life for almost everybody. Um, some of us are able to, to continue to access our labs and to continue with our experiments with the caveat of added precaution, but we understand that not everybody has that same um, capability. So as the seasons change, the autumn leaves are coming in, but that also brings cold and flu season. And so we have no idea what's gonna happen, what lies ahead with COVID-19. Um, so that being said, we're here, we wanna ensure that you guys have the possibility to continue your work, even if you're not in the lab. Um, so if you are a current owner of an MBF product and you'd like to get a license to work from home, please contact our technical support team. Um, they will provide you with a temporary license. Um, and if you're not a current owner, it's a great time to try out the products. Um, free trials are available for a lot of these MBF bioscience products. Two quick things to point out before we um, continue on. <laughs> uh, if you are working from home, please ensure that you have your large files stored on your local machine or on a portable hard drive. That's really important. It'll cut down on the time it takes to load those images and to access that data. And similarly, uh, it's not similar. Neurolucida 360 cannot be accessed using a VPN or a remote connection. You need to be at the PC to use the program. Um, I'm going to move forward and pass this off to Sue. Sue, you want to talk about uh, FAIR data? I do. I do very much so. So uh, in addition to all of the great new features that we're going to talk about today, I just want to highlight some of the initiatives that we are, we're working on that happen sort of under the hood. It's more of a philosophy of making our data that, that is able to be produced within our software as well as our software tools more FAIR. So what is FAIR? FAIR is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And uh, over the past year, we've been dedicating a fair amount of energy to 
looking at the ways that we can make it easier for you to reuse your data, share your data with your colleagues, and make um, your um, output, your image data and your experimental um, morphology data, more reusable by yourself and by others. And that includes adding information um, as metadata within the data files themselves, so the morphology files and the image files, so that they can travel independently of you. And so we've done that in two ways. One, we've published our file spec. TJ, can you give me a new slide? There you go. So our file spec is a really exciting thing for us. Um, our file spec is the data file that describes your morphology data. So we have written instructions, this is what the file spec is, and it covers over 30 years of constant, continuous, and dedicated development to encoding information about morphological structures of the nervous system. And so the file spec is available, you can access it from our website, to read the docs documentation and we've also submitted a, a manuscript for consideration that describes how this information can be used by neuroscientists and other people interested in taking the data um, gener uh, generated in Neuralucida 360 or Neuralucida and, and using it for other purposes like MATLAB scripts or um, uh, other types of information like neuron. And in addition to that, we've also created a FAIR image converter. So the first part was about our morphology data. And then the second part is that all of that morphology data comes from an image source. And it's one thing to have image data that is very rich in the, in, in the information that it encodes in the pixels, but it's also important that, that meta, the information about the image or the tissue that it came from is as rich as possible so that data can stand alone. And so Microfile Plus is a new application that we've created. It is freely available and you can access it now, download it and use it. And it will convert optical microscopy image data into various file formats, OME TIFF and JPEG 2000. But importantly, it allows you to add or amend relevant metadata. Importantly, the channel target label, fluorophore and pseudocolor, as well as the voxel sizes. Macy and Aiden at our company just did a wonderful webinar last week. I encourage you to take a look at it if, if, if this is something that's interesting to you. But let's get back to what Neuralista 360 has to offer to you today. Um, so right when you open Neuralista 360, you'll be presented with this welcome screen. If you click on this what's new icon, you'll be brought to our website and you can see a really well written out page of what's new with a bunch of different call outs and graphics. Um, here, we're here to demonstrate what, what those do. Um, so just to quickly go over them, this has been a multi-year endeavor on our end. This is, we're so excited to, to be able to show this to you guys today. Um, there's been major overhauls to the way that images and data are being read, which results in blazing fast speeds um, and editing your files. And so we've actually done some, some experiments and some testing here. We've seen results up to 5,000 times faster for opening your image. So that's, I mean, that's just incredible to be able to, it's incomprehensible, it's great. Um, it allows us to work with our data a little bit more efficiently, a little quicker, and that makes everybody a little happier. These updates also allow us to get the most out of these powerful machines that we've been recommending. Um, so if you have multi-core system, we're gonna be using all those cores and we're really gonna be pushing through and, and making everything as zippy and fast as possible for you guys. Um, we've also replaced a couple of our, our features and our tools. Um, first off, the puncta detection tool. I know a lot of you guys are here for that and then the sub-volume mode. That's another um, kind of overhaul of the large volume reconstruction mode. Um, so those two things are really important and those are major topics that we wanna to cover today. There's also an easy to use channel selection tool and we also have better image format capabilities. So when we talk about those format capabilities, we're really talking about um, what's under the hood, but we're also talking about this. We have a new image opener dialog so let's say you have a container file like a LIF or a CZI. If you drag and drop that into our old version of the program, you'd be forced to choose one image and that's it. 
You can only open one image at a time and you'd need to save it, convert it, yada, yada. Now we have this new image opener tool. So if you have your container file, you can drag and drop it right into the program and you can see every single file that's held within that container. So you can choose from one to a few to all of these files and you can open them in a number of different ways. You can open them in the same location, like one on top of each other. If there's embedded data within this container file, you can open them in the original location that they were acquired. And then lastly, there's the grid layout. Um, so we just have a number of different ways that we can that we can work with these container files, and this is um, extensively better than it was before. So we're very happy to to talk about that. What we're even more excited to talk about is the capability of Neurolucida 360. Um, so I'm gonna make my 3D window full screen for you guys. And let's bring in the our large image. So this is, it'll happen pretty quickly. I just dragged and dropped my image and in just a second, we'll see that it's completely here in this 3D window. Um, lightning fast. <laughs> this is an yeah, image I from- that image though, like- it's um so this, I I have this on my on my C drive this, this is local and it's about 33 gigabytes compressed and we use about a 1 to 20 compression. So this is a a pretty large image to say the least. Um as you can see as I click and move and manipulate the image you'll notice that the resolution continues to update in in real time until we reach that full resolution. Um Another thing that I'm kind of excited to point out is this image was what Sue and I demonstrated on um, about a year and a half ago. This is what we use for our large volume reconstruction image. And so if if you go back and watch that, it, it was a lengthy process to open it. You, you needed a specific user profile. Now we can work and load the entire image and we can see all of the parts at the full resolution as we continue to work with it. Um, so Sue, what do you, what do you think we should do to start off? Maybe draw a contour? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, zoom out a little bit, um, hit the home button so we can see the, you know, the full entirety of this and let's try, why don't you draw an arbitrary ROI? Um, you know, give me an open contour that specifies say a boundary for where, um, this, uh, cell sends its axon um, into a new region. That okay. looks wonderful. <clears throat> so from here, we can go into tree and we can look at the whole image once again. And we could just go ahead and trace this at this kind of full bird's eye view, but it's, it's a little bit more um, manageable to look at it in this sense. So right now I clicked on the sub volume icon right underneath our puncta icon also new. And what we have here in the 3D environment is a cube. So with this cube, we're allowed to, or we're, we're able to generate little sub volumes and regions of interest within our 3D environment. So if I click and drag, I can move the entire cube. I can also use these spheres on the edges to make it longer or smaller in the X, Y, and the Z. Um, so what I'm looking at now is just how far in depth are we in Z. I can slide that over, and then all I need to do is hit view subvolume. That will quickly snap and show us the entire subvolume that we've just kind of parameterized with that cubic area. TJ, that was really quick. It was so fast. It's that's the work of our new imaging engine. It's it's pretty impressive. Um, <laughs> so right now it's just loading the image region. Um, but from here, we're able to just quickly trace with our user guided mode. I can go up until I reach an area where I'm happy with, and then I'm gonna right click. I'm gonna zoom in a little bit more so I can create this proper bifurcation. And then I'm just gonna continue to trace along as if it was normal. Um, we can edit within this mode. Everything is gonna be the same as if we were looking at it from our regular um, 3D perspective. But one thing you will notice is that as I got to the edge of my subvolume, the the program automatically generated a new subvolume for me, um, the same size, and it's just going to slowly transition it 
and slide it over as we continue to move. And so I'll do this last sub volume. Um, we'll just wait for it to load. And this last sub volume, I'm gonna right click once more and end the tracing. So we're still in this sub volume mode, as you can see. If I hit home, it's gonna show us the entire image. Uh, I just did air quotes. You guys won't be able to see that in the recording. So the entire image is present, but we're really only showing the sub volume. To review the entire volume, I'll click sub volume once again and click view full volume. So that will give us the true overarching view of the entire image. Um, one other thing that I wanted to point out about sub volume is that there is a, a save sub volume option. So if you're working in a region of interest that you need to return to multiple times, or you just wanna save it so that you can refer to it um, if you need to reopen the image at any point, clicking save sub volume is gonna save that in this save locations area. And then you can load or delete them at your pleasure. Um, so let's return to tree and we can show off another tool uh, that, that's in development and we're gonna be continuing um, to develop as, as time proceeds. Um, I'll go to edit and I'm gonna click classify. So classify is a new feature. Sue, do you wanna talk about that a little bit? I really do. I, I'm, I'm super excited about this. And so you didn't have to draw an arbitrary region of interest for to use sub volume. We set that up so that we can demonstrate what we're thinking about when we created this classify structure. So we know that um, neurons uh, traverse great distances and they go very many places. The, the terminations of the um, terminal arbors can innervate different regions of interest, and that can be very uh, relevant and important to the understanding of, of the, how these cell populations work. And so what Classify allows you to do is it allows you to, to take individual segments and apply an additional level of understanding on top of it. And so now what you could do, TJ, is if you selected one of these branches, mm -hmm. yeah, select that, the, the upper one. The upper one, okay. Yeah. Select that one. And let's say that that one's um, in a terminal field. So now we can say it's still an axon and it still belongs to this neuron, but this branch or this portion of the segment is actually in the terminal field. You could do the same thing with um, by naming regions of interest or any other um, important information that you wanted to provide, but this allows you to expand the, the information that you're able to pull out of the data. We are in the process of adding additional analyses to Neurolucida Explorer to allow you to exploit um, the ability to arbitrarily name portions of, of trees like this. And so as you think about how you might want to use this new enhanced capability, I really encourage you to, to reach out to us and let us know how you're thinking of using this and we'll implement it into the analysis procedure so that you can pull out that information. Areas that I think um, I'm very excited about is that it will allow you to say, okay, well, how much of this axon's um, length is within the dentate, or, or how many varicosities are inside the, the termination field of the target region versus um, the entirety of the axon itself? What's the branch level at which it, it enters your region of interest? Um, those sorts of things are things that I think are functionally and anatomically relevant to um, many research applications, but I'm sure the sky's the limit on things that you may reach for with that particular thing. So we are really looking for your feedback on, on where you'd like to take it next. Yeah. Um, I think that's, that's a, a pretty good coverage of the yep. classify and then of sub volume as well. Um, Another thing about subvolume, you don't need to just work in the user guided mode. You can work in the automatic tracing mode. You can do detections, um, editing. Everything can be done as if you were working in that full 3D environment. We're just making that a little bit more compact for you so it's a little bit more manageable. Um, I think there's one last thing. Oh. One last thing, not punked yet, almost. Um, <laughs> uh, sorry, guys. There's, there's an icon up here as well. So if you are in the sub volume mode and you have data that's outside of your, your region of interest or your sub volume, there is an icon next to the show hide tracing button. And that's to clip 
the tracing to your image area. So it's very similar to show and hide. All we're gonna do is take away everything that's not in your sub volume. Anything that's in your sub volume will show. And once that moves over, if you hit the boundary, we're gonna hide everything that you just traced and then we'll show you just what's in your current sub volume. Um, so that's just the last little snippet on, on sub volume for now. Okay, now, now Puncta? Now we can do Puncta, yes. Okay. <laughs> so let me, let me close yeah. this down okay. and we'll, we'll bring in a nice, um, a nice Puncta image. So um, if you have seen us at SFN in previous years, or oh. if you've gotten an online demonstration and looked for um, synapse detection, this is the image that you, you would have seen. Um, as we said at the beginning, synapse detection is no more. We've replaced it with this much more superior um, Puncta detection. So with Puncta, I'm gonna click on it right away. And it's asking us to use the channel panel to pick a single channel. What's very rhymy, channel? very okay. fun. Great question. The channel panel is over here on the left. Um, so this is something new and distinct to Neurolucida 360 2020.3.1. Um, this is just a way that we can distinguish and choose which channel we'd like to work in. Um, and then that has further implications. Sue, do you want to, do you want to talk about those? Yeah, first, um, can we just take a moment to enjoy the fact that you just instantly changed um, the channel image display like that? Do it again, yeah. do it again, one more and time. It, it's pretty, pretty high resolution yeah. the second so, we click on the image. Yeah, because, that, because we replaced the entire image engine. We've refactored how we think about and handle image data. And what that results in is um, much more um, tactile access to all portions of the image and that includes um, the dimensional data so channel information as well so the channel panel allows you in the 3d window to specify where you're what you want to see but it goes beyond that to allow you to associate tracing that you're going to do tj you're automatically tracing this axon thank you very mm -hmm. much using mm -hmm. box thing and your this trace is now going to be associated with the red channel. And so let me just break this out a little bit more back to fair a little bit. So now if your image data had a channel label assigned to each of those channels, so we happen to know because we know Francisco and he told us all about this image, we know that this is um, an axon that has been filled um, and that that's what we're looking at, but you can record that information in the image data. Additionally, if you switch to the green channel, now we're looking at the v -glute. So this is v -glute one so these are uh, vesicular glutamate labels. And now, if you had that information tied in your uh, image data, everything is going to be kept in sync. So now, as your data moves, the trace data will say, hey, I traced this tree structure in the red channel. Oh, what's the red channel? Oh, it's an axon. The green channel is v glute one Now, show off Puncta, because it's so, cool. Yeah, uh, just to kind of piggyback off that real quick, you'll notice that the, the branch that we traced is almost gone. It, there's a kind of ghostly shadow here in this green channel. And that's because the thing that we've traced is not in the green channel. We have a, an opacity slider and everything that's not in the present channel is going to be um, almost hidden. It's going to become a little bit more transparent. So we're not going to be um, kind of interrupting or or making the channel that you're looking at more hectic. We're, we really want to make sure that you can you can focus and you can and have those um, detections and all of your interests right in this one channel. So as Sue was mentioning, uh, Puncta, this is this is huge. And so what we can do is we can go right in and if we know that there's a punctum that we're interested in, we can click and we can detect it. Um, so right there, boom, we have one puncta. If we know that there's 10 that we're interested in, we can do that as well. That's gonna take a little bit of time. So I'm gonna clear that last one and then I'm gonna go through and click detect all, but I wanna detect it based on a proximity 
of our neuron that we've already traced. So if I go into the settings, we can actually detect puncta um, in proximity to a lot of things, trees, spines, somas, varicosities, and even other puncta. So for this example, we'll raise it up to eight, and then we can get rid of these two options because we don't have spines or varicosities in this image. So with the detect based on proximity checked, and we have our three parameters here, I can go ahead and click detect all. The three parameters are fairly straightforward, but it, it's nice to always get a refresher. The detector diameter is looking, the, the way that these are detected is we place seeds around um, the more saturated areas, which is the sensitivity. So if there's a saturated staining and there's a good contrast between the foreground and background, that's what the sensitivity is looking for. To go backward, the detector diameter is really looking at, it's creating these spheres and it wants to create a diameter of five microns. So if you have a punctum that's bigger than five microns, then it would likely be ignored. Um, and then lastly is this minimum size. We're looking at um, what the limit is, or what the, what the not limit, what the, the minimum voxel, so the minimum size, the minimum amount of pixels in 3D that it's gonna take to generate um, a puncta, a puncta. Mm -hmm. so, so that minimum size is a good way to help um, address any shot noise or imaging um, noise in your system. So that's that's an area where you can help balance, not just how big it is, but what what's your criteria for small when you are setting the detector. Um, one thing, TJ, that I just want to mention is that this is very similar to how Synapse works. So Synapse required a traced structure, and then what the detector did is it followed the um, structure and and looked at a, a boundary from the from the structure itself. So along the axon or the tree or the dendrite, it looked for um, putative synapses. In this case, by using the proximity. We not only allow you to do it on the basis of tree, which is what Synapse did before, but now you can select all those other features like soma, inside or outside the soma, varicosity, spines, etc. But if you don't want to do that, you can do the whole image. So TJ just changed all of the ones that he used using the proximity detector to orange. And now if he runs the detector, like, oh, he's going to put them as a snap. <laughs> I, I didn't want to, I didn't want to do that right away, but yeah, so. <laughs> So with, with this sets feature, um, this isn't new, but it, it, it's nice to highlight anytime we can. Um, so with this, I created cell one. And so everything that I had placed in this set, all the puncta and the branch, this is cell one. If we were to open this in Neurolucida Explorer, cell one would be its own traced structure. So we'd be able to run a number of analyses just on this um, set that we've created. So as Sue is saying, if we wanted to go back, I can keep all the existing puncta. Whoops, I clicked on a punctum by accident. Sorry, everyone. Um, if we wanted to keep all the existing puncta, but we wanted to see what the relation is between the, the cell one that we've just created and all of these puncta, we can detect all once again. And in just a second, we'll see a lot more puncta has been detected. So this is a significant difference from how Synapse used to work because Synapse, again, required um, a boundary, um, a target, a traced target in order to do the detection. This allows you to do the detection across the entire image within the channel that we've, we've uh, selected um, for right now. And so now we have our over 1500 puncta, um, but if we were really only interested in the ones that were close, we can click on this cell one once again, and we can see the highlighted ones in Neurolucida 360. This is also readily available in Neurolucida Explorer where we can do a little bit more of a deep dive. Yeah. Um, if I go back to Puncta, that's everything on the automatic side, but we do have machine learning that we've implemented. Also uh, super excited about this. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, <laughs> so because this image is, let me hide everything and I'll return to the all channels so we can see everything. This is a really clean and crisp image with not a lot of um, 
signal, not a lot of noise. There's there's, no, there's minimal. plenty of signal, not a lot of noise. That's what I meant. Yeah. <laughs> so there's a lot, there's a lot to look at, but this is a fairly simple image. Um, we do have a more complex image that the machine learning will work on. And because of, um, well, because of how clean this is. If we were to switch over to a different image, this is provided by... Um, Sarah oh Stanley. Thank you. I totally so Sarah forgot. Sarah Stanley is, um, this is an image of, I think, the dorsal, dorsal root ganglia. And you can see that um, this is a gorgeous image. It's a uh, cleared tissue and she's um, labeled uh, cells um, with multiple labels. So you've got a red and green channel um, that's present, but you can also see that there's quite a bit of additional signal. So this will highlight the benefit of machine learning a bit better than our nice, crisp, clean demo, demo image from Francisco Alvarez. Um, and the relevance here um, is that machine learning can be used to, um, you know, find pictures of, you know, recognize cats and dogs from images and stuff, but we can also um, utilize it for, you know, scientific purposes too, strangely. And we can use that um, technique to provide a, um, a classifier that is trained to identify particular features um, within the image. And so we've trained a classifier automatically um or not automatically we trained the classifier and it's embedded in the in the software itself so you don't have to go through the work yourself it's already ready for you to use and when tj um demonstrates the seeds um by selecting the machine learning it still uses the same algorithm but what it does is it layers on an additional level of intelligence to say okay well we don't need this many seeds it's unlikely that all of these things actually represent objects that we're actually interested in. And so by using machine learning, we're going to um, apply some smarts to this to say, let's validate the information based on the objects that we know that we're looking for. So what we've previously trained against, and that's what it's doing right now. So this is drastically different. We would have seen something close to over a thousand um puncta prior now we have uh, 85 and so what we can do here is we can we can look at specifically this channel we can also look in the green channel and we can see as we move here i'm going to move the opacity all the way down and clear those out we can see that there's even more puncta um, to be detected here so we can go with the same parameters and we can do detect all and in just a second, we'll see everything that was labeled in this green channel. So I'm gonna go ahead and click edit, and I'm gonna change this color so that we can have a nice visual um, comparison when we move over to Neurolucida Explorer. I think pink would be fine, right? Let's see how that compares. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, um, that's that's what we were looking for here. We really wanted to detect these puncta. And we can use this save and view in Neurolucida Explorer button to um, obviously save the file. So we'll call this one test puncta. And I'm gonna save that to my desktop. And then it's gonna launch Neurolucida Explorer for us. And it opened right in the correct window, which is always lovely. And so from here, we can visually see that there's a lot of puncta that have some overlap. Um, but it's really hard to quantify that with our eyes. So what we can do under structure, I'll click punctum and it's gonna highlight all the puncta for us. And then if I go to analyze and punctum, we can, we'll run these three analyses to start and we can kind of describe some of the further ones in a second. But when I click okay, almost instantaneously, we'll get our results. Um, so we can look at individual puncta, and as we click through Neurolucida Explorer, it's going to highlight the punctum that it's reporting on in this data table. We also have a summary, which is nice, and it doesn't just show the one channel, it shows both channels. Um, so that needs to expand a little bit, but it's visually present. <clears throat> and then lastly, we do have a colocalization. We chose the value of 50%. That's up to you, whatever... Um, 
percent overlap you're looking for that can be accommodated. So it's a really nice way to to kind of get the quantitative data right away from the image that you've reconstructed. <clears throat> And we can also click this current windows button as always to push these three tables into a microsoft excel file where we can do further averaging we can make pivot tables and we can make graphs for any sort of publication that you're looking for so tj let me take just a minute to um talk about um proximity and co-localization yeah i think that's a great distinction to make yeah because we use proximity in norlusta 360 as a means to limit the detection, right? So we're gonna limit the detection space by using the proximity to other trace structures. So in this case, when you did this um, detection on Sarah Stanley's DRGs, um, you did it across the entire image. But another thing that you could have selected if you wanted to, depending on how complex the image is or how specific you want to be with respect to the puncta, is that you could say, look, I'm only interested in looking for green puncta um, that are in proximity to already previously detected red puncta. And, and you can use that to limit the search space that the algorithms are going to be applied. When it comes to the analyses for Neuralucida Explorer, we're, we're looking at actual physical distances when we're doing co-localization. And so in that case, we're talking about the measured existences of these puncta not not the search space so proximity is is um relevant for the search space and then co-localization is okay well how far away are these and and what is their overlap in terms of co-localization and so they do represent two different um concepts and this can also have an impact on whether or not you choose um soma detection or puncta detection so there was a question that's already been asked about whether or not you know it makes sense to use puncta detection for these somas that we just did we just did nuclei with this particular label here in this drg but we could have also used soma detection and so you can play with the two different algorithms they're different algorithms you may find that you are able to get different information from them but one particular feature of of the puncta detection is the ability to utilize machine learning with that radio button and also the ability to decide whether or not you want to limit the search space relative to other um, trace structures so i just want to uh, offer that out there yeah um sue someone had asked a question about the maximum number of channels we can load effectively i think we have an image <laughs> that wasn't set up that wasn't set up um we we do have an image that we can show. Do we want to try and jump into that, and just just to show the, the hey, efficiency? Hey, if you want to of... do that, I'll, I'll start talking about it. So I want to yeah. give a big shout out to um, all of our software developers who have worked really hard on those imaging engines, and then the trace engine. So the trace engine deals with how we handle the detected objects, and the imaging engine is obviously um, how we handle the image data that comes in, the various caching mechanisms that we're doing, and the number of channels that we can support and the number of images that we can support is effectively um, uh, sky's the limit. So uh, the file spec for JPEG 2000 supports, I think, 16,000 channels. We limit the UI right now to 16, but if you've got some, an image that is more than 16 channels give me a call um and we'd be happy to extend that but um uh tj you'll you've got this nice image up so that's nice so you you would notice as you load more more image data with more channels that the number of of um options in the um channel panel will increase for the number of channels that you have, and it will also shift down if needed to take up some of that trace opacity space. So have some fun bringing these big, you know, multi-dimensional image data and do what you want with them. There's also no limit on the number of images that you can have loaded into the software. The 3D window works on one image at a time. 
And so you will, if you load a um, multiple images, you will have to select which image you actually want to operate on in the 3D window. But the system itself can support many images um, and you can select which one you want to look at based on the image organizer. So I just want to lay that out. We haven't played a whole lot or demonstrated much with the, the main window of Neuralusta 360, but um, mainly because we really want to show off how um, synchronous uh, the data is now between the 2D and the 3D window. That's a major improvement um, over the previous version, and so we're pretty excited about that. So um, let, me, let me answer a few more questions. Um, are there size limits on the software? So I think I just answered that one, Tessa, or Teresa. So if, if I didn't cover that correctly, um, just rephrase your question and I'll try again. Um, Octavio would like to know whether or not it, we can use it with another cell type, such as astrocytes microglia to quantify their morphology. Absolutely. We love microglia and astrocytes. Um, there are, there's more than one cell type in the brain. So um, we, are, we are fans of all the cell types. Um, and uh, astrocytes and microglia have some really um, fantastic morphology. Um, and you can use uh, Neuralusta 360 to um, uh, represent that in information as well. The fact that you can now classify um, tree structures as well um, can give you some additional um, capability to add some more information uh, for um, non-neuronal structure. So, you know, astrocytes obviously don't have dendrites, and so you can you can use that structure to um, provide labels that are more relevant to the cell type that you're looking at. Uh, finally, oh, I can't hear you, TJ. Thank you. I had muted myself accidentally. Okay. Um, <laughs> I was just moving and grabbing um, because we weren't, I wasn't able to quickly get that um, multi-channel image right away. I was just oh, looking to find it all. Yeah. No, but I do now if we wanted to okay. open this up. Yeah, go uh, ahead, shut it off. Let's see. So this is in the 2D window. And then once we open this 3D window, we'll see it in just a snap. This might be the wrong version of the program. There's no channel panel. So this is an example of the old version of Neurolucida 360. <laughs> Let me find the right version. Yeah, why don't we do? This is what I'll, we're used to. I'll answer some more questions while okay. you uh, while you uh, sort yourself out. Um, I do think that this is a wonderful example of of just the what we've accomplished with the the new version of the software, but I don't think that's what you intended. Nope, I did not. That's I apologize to everyone who had to sit through that. <laughs> um, Martha Windrum has an excellent question. She asks, if the nucleus is in one channel, for example, DAPI, will the program still connect processes in another channel to the nucleus? The answer is yes, although um, you'll have to decide at that point which channel the, the structure belongs to, right? Because if you're connecting a... Um, uh, a branch. Um, uh, a good example for me is the axon initiating segment. So sometimes you can label um, uh, that that portion of that uh, axon um, in another channel, but it is still part of the axon. And so if you want to be able to trace the structure, um, that will be in one channel and then the axon, uh, the rest of the axon will be in a different um, channel. And so you can absolutely trace the structure across channels, you, you just have to make that um, determination of, you know, the ownership. So that would be another example of where you could use the, um, the trace association of the branch to say, okay, well, this is, this is the axon initiating segment um, and, and everything else is the axon. TJ, do you have the image up or the right uh, version? Not I yet. I was... I couldn't find it on my desktop, so hopefully this oh, will. Okay. It's well, still, for some reason, it's not. I keep opening the wrong one, so that's okay. my fault. That's okay. We've got lots of questions, so okay. maybe we should 
um, focus on that. All right, I found it. But yes, let's well, let's do questions. That's that'll make for much better. Which version of NeuroLucid Explorer did TJ demo for us? So the the version that I was looking at is also the the latest um, version of NeuroLucid Explorer. So this is from October first. Um, I believe this is available now. Sue, is that yeah. right? Yeah, I believe it is. Yeah. Uh, we are also planning on adding additional analyses for um, those things that I was telling you about. So um, this version will be out and then we'll follow up with another version as we get new um, analyses added. We can, so there is a big thing that happened actually with Neurolucida Explorer that happened with the previous release, which is that we separated it from Neurolucida 360 distinctly. The reason why we did that is so that we can have asynchronous releases of the two software. So previously, we basically had to um, release them as a package deal. So every time we released Neur Neurolucida 360, we would release Neurolucida Explorer and vice versa. However, they represent two entirely different applications with different purposes. And we wanted to be able to release Neurolucid Explorer anytime we have new functionality for it. So when you install Neurolucid Explorer, when you update, you're going to be asked to authorize your, your license, most likely. Um, and just go ahead and do that. It will not cost you anything. We just need to officially break them out into um, two separate um, locations so that we can um, update them asynchronously for you. So. Um, that is, you will not have to relicense your Neuralista 360 software when you update, however. TJ, this looks amazing. So four channels, huh? Yeah, I, I apologize for the delay in that, everyone. That was a little embarrassing. But we can we can see all the four channels. We can isolate them as well. And then a, a little bit more on that. If we go to image and adjust, we can see the image histogram here as well. And this is something else that we've... Um, modified and and really pushed forward prior to this there was a, a kind of clunky image sync with 2d button so you would need to work in two different fields you need to work on image adjustment and then you'd need to push those changes through now with the neurolucid version 2020.3.1 we can move the image histogram white point black point the gamma and that's going to automatically push directly to this 3D environment. So we no longer need you to do a two-step process. This is just one fluid um, connection between the adjustment window and the histogram and this 3D environment, the image that you're working on. While you're here, why don't you show off a little bit of partial projection? Yeah. So that's another really helpful thing. Um, I think that this is a really helpful tool, especially when we are working in such large images like this, where there's a lot going on. Um, so partial projection limits the amount of information that's being shown in this 3D window at any one time. And that works in all three axes. Um, so we can look in the X, Y, or Z. Um, and this is not limited to all the channels. We can look at one channel specifically. and then. We can also look at, if I go back to all, it, you, can, you can see that the display is also changing in this image adjustment window. So if we were only concerned with the green, the red, and the yellow, we can get rid of this blue channel, and now we can look specifically at what we're interested in. And with partial projection, we can limit that even further, and we can look at specific areas that we're interested in right within this 3D region. Yep, so that's an important consideration. So the channel panel is really re relevant for how trace information, so those, those trace structures that you're generating are attributed to data, but the image adjustment window is relevant for what you're looking at. So the, the channel panel is a toggle, the image adjustment really provides all of the complexity that you really want. If you have three channels selected um, for display, out of four and you you know detect somas or reconstruct things the channel the 
the trace information is not assigned to a channel because there's um, information from multiple channels being displayed. So we will only assign trace information to a channel when a single channel is being displayed. So you can you can utilize that to your um, uh, benefit when you're deciding um, what to use when um, for the different detection algorithms as well as when you're inspecting and and navigating. Mm -hmm. um, Sue, how would you feel about if we close this and we go back to the um, the smaller puncta detection and we can talk a little bit more about what happens for editing in this channel panel? Does that sound okay? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's good because the channel panel is new, right? So the um, it provides a lot of flexibility, but that also means that it is a little complex. And so we want you to understand, have some exposure to how you can utilize that and what it means for editing structures, um, which is slightly different. So you still have all that same editing capability, but if you trace an object within a single structure, you need to go back to that display um, pairing in order to do um, dramatic edits. So splitting, merging, individual point edits. So let's let's show an example of that. If I go ahead and I do this automatic tracing in the red channel, that will be finished in just one second. Okay, so now when I move over to Puncta, it's still gonna be in this red channel. So again, we'll switch over to green. And as we said before, this has been um, made transparent. So let's go based on proximity once more, we'll go back to eight and let's get these Puncta detected. <clears throat> While we're in this green channel, we have the ability to create, I clicked by accident, we have the ability to edit um, with much more detail. So we can look at individual puncta and we can split them, we can click on multiple, and we can merge them together if we think there's been some sort of uh, mistake in there that they've been separated by that automatic detection. We can change the color, we can change the smoothness and transparency and the texture. That's all great and well, but if I go to all and I wanna look at all of my data in all the channels, what we're really looking at is an overview of our data, but we're not looking at the in-depth nature of our data. We can no longer split or merge these puncta. We'll, we'll only be able to change the color and we'll be able to remove them and some of the other more global things that Sue had mentioned before. Um, and the same will go for any of these sort of processes that are detected. On the flip side, if I go to the red channel and I click edit and I select my tree and I realize that <clears throat> this was actually supposed to be in the green channel this whole time, I can actually go down and in this edit window, there's a channel option and we can select the channel that it should belong in. So this is extremely helpful for those of us that are used to working in a more um, encompassing view. So if we'd like to work with all of our data present at once, and we started tracing without um, isolating that channel, <clears throat> excuse me, if we were to do that, we would we would be able to edit, but if I went to the red channel, I would not be able to edit because it's in this encompassing all channel. So that's where the the edit and channel options are, are really important. Um, so wanna, if you, yep. I wanna add another thing because this ties back to Martha's question from before. Like she had a cell, you know, a soma detected uh, for a DAPI nucleus and then she did tree detection in another channel. How does she associate those guys back together again? So you could, if you wanted to, when you select a single channel, that's the pixel information that the algorithm is using for the detection. So that's different pixel information, voxel information, if it's a 3D image, than if all channels are being displayed. So you, you will choose the right display for the right type of detection that you're looking to do. However, once it's detected, you may want to be able to make these um, relevant associations that bring it back to the macro structure of the neuron itself. We, we want to be able to allow you the flexibility to make these statements, which is why we have the ability to assign data to channels now, 
why we have the ability to do detections based on proximity when it comes to puncta, and also why we have this um, uh, capacity called SETS. So that's an old, you know, that's been around for ages and it's continually been um, added onto, but, but those things allow us to make these um, groupings of information that are relevant for us to take a part of the whole and look at that individually. And so there's a lot of flexibility here for you to um, create the data. And then once the data is created to um, choose how it's displayed and how you um, are able to interpret it, not only quantitatively with Neuralusta Explorer, but also visually when you inspect it in Neuralucida 360. So I hope that that tackles some of the, the nuance here because there's a lot going on, right? We've got the channel panel, we've got the image adjustment window. And just to underscore those two things again, the image adjustment window displays um, the channels in 2D and 3D. So the 3D window right now is covering the 2D area, but it does impact both of them simultaneously and directly. Um, and when you have more channels, you can display a combinatorial selection by um, choosing to display them based on the image adjustment window. The channel panel is relevant for how the detection algorithms are going to be operating on the image data. So one is for visualization, one is for detection, but once things are detected, you can kind of, you know, play with them as you need to, okay? So um, I, I hope that that is something that you're excited about, and I'm, I'm rather excited about the flexibility that that offers, even though it does offer some additional complexity in the getting used to it. TJ, how's that? How's that sound? Did you you want to add anything, or do you want to? I think we're I th almost done here. Yeah, I was going to see if there was any other questions that we may have missed. Um, Always, I'm which sure is why I love doing webinars. To be perfectly honest, um, I like I like the the interaction um, and finding out what people are really interested in. Um, there was one that just came in, uh, King asked, based on the VGLU image, can you predict the spheral soma that they are enclosed with? Oh, so for determination of settings, I think. Um, there were a couple of questions about how to parameterize Puncta. Yeah. Um, and for Let's... me, I, I find it just easiest to uh, do a little bit of trial and error. Um, the quantitative size based on the detections are are going to be available um, in Neuralucida Explorer. So if you're having trouble um, classifying things or parameterizing, the strategy that I use, because it's easy, is I'll do a click to detect a puncta and then save and open in NLE, see what the size is, and then adjust the detectors accordingly, the parameters. That's That's the fastest way for me to parameterize, but I'm sure that there are other strategies that you can use. Yeah, there's another another way that you can, <clears throat> excuse me, another way that you can try and um, sneak around that is we do have the puncta available visually in 2D. There is a tool to measure things in 2D if you wanted to get a rough estimate rather than bouncing. It's honestly whatever um, works most efficiently for you because in the long run, uh, the goal is that you're going to be able to find that data and get that reconstructed without any issue. Um, so yeah. it's just a matter of which path you want to take to get to that final um, answer. So um, I want to thank everybody for all of the questions and all of the information that um, you've shared with your questions. I hope you're, you are excited about what we've created and that you're going to give it a try and let us know how we can continue to improve it to make it suit your needs and where you want to go next even better. Um, I'm, I'm really pretty excited about that. Uh, we have also launched a new mechanism for people to um, participate in the community of users, and those are our forums. So I highly encourage you to take a look at them and start a discussion that 
can be more than just reaching out to us via tech support or direct contact with me or TJ. And you can start talking with other people who use the software for their own purposes, because as, as you know, the Neuralista 360 can be used for a wide variety of, of purposes for image analysis of microscopy image data, um, neuroscience or not. And, and there's a lot of tips and tricks that, that people have um, identified and, and use in their own lab. And so please visit them. You can also, from the forums, you can, you can learn about getting access to the file spec as well as Microfile Plus, which is our free image converter um, for creating fair microscopy data. And, um, and, and I, I hope that those bring us all closer together when we're all forced to be far apart because of COVID. I want to thank um, the National Institute of Mental Health and the SPARC program. They both, we both have, we have grants from both of these organizations and that funding was instrumental for the developments that you see today. Uh, the SPARC program is also um, helping us lead the charge in uh, our FAIR initiative. And I think that that's something that is a very exciting new avenue for MBF, and I'm looking forward to seeing where that takes us as well. We can't do any of this without um, the tight interaction with our users, um, and we are grateful to the Allen Institute for Brain Science, Sarah Stanley, Francisco Alvarez, and we showed some beautiful neuro art submissions in our presentations as well. All of these people provided permission for us to use their image data today. And we're really grateful because um, they do really represent a means for us to learn directly what we need to do in order to make our product better. So we yeah. really appreciate that, that interaction. There is one name that we left off this list and that's uh, Dr. Chip Gerfin. We that's weren't right. planning to show the image um, and then I got um eager so that's that's kind of why he he's not on there but we we also like to thank him for for his permission to use that yeah thank well. you Chan. one other thing before we go is that you can try neurolucida 360 please um if you don't own it or you want to try out puncta and you're an essentials user reach out to us we'll we'll help get you hooked up so you can learn how to use it see if it's going to suit your needs and how you can streamline your work two i want to mention that the image and trace engine improvements I think will be helpful for those of you who are working from home and you're using a COVID license. The, these improvements will make your, your, um, your high powered graphics, you know, gaming machine that we encourage people to use that much better, but it will also, because of the smart caching and the image handling that we're doing and, and the multi-threading that we've you know, employed in these new developments will make every system work better. You're still gonna run into limits if you've got you know, a, a laptop like me, but I can do so much more on my Surface laptop than I could um, with the previous version of the software. So it is a, a major improvement for all computer systems. If you're thinking about upgrading, we have some real um, good suggestions on which components to upgrade first. So reach out to sales if you have a question about that. And then finally, there were a couple questions about other applications. I'm so excited that this has got you excited about what we are building. Uh, there were a couple questions about Vesalucida 360 and whether or not uh, we're going to be hearing about Vesalucida 360. The answer is yes. It will be released soon and the um, trace engine and image engine improvements are definitely a part of it, as well as every other software that we're working on right now. So as they are released from this point forward, you will all begin to see these engines um, available in all of the applications. Lastly, there was a question about whether or not Neuralucida 360 can handle time series data. 
I'm sad to say no, but I'm happy to say that we have another application, Microdynamics, which is built using many of the relevant technologies from Neuralusta 360, but with the added component of that better understanding of how image or how files relate to each other and keeping trace information um, relevant and aligned across time. Uh, so I encourage you to try microdynamics. That's especially relevant if you are um, studying um, spine motility uh, and dynamics um, in particular. So TJ, anything else you want to add? Um, I just wanted to say thank you for everyone attending. Uh, thank you for your questions. Um, and then in the survey, if it's if the question isn't there, let us know how you'd like us to keep in touch. What can we do to to keep these things moving forward? We know that SFN has been canceled for this year, and that's a really big opportunity for us to meet you guys in person and show off what we've been working on. Um, so if if you know, since SFN isn't around this year, it's pretty upsetting, but we'd still like to to get in contact with you guys and we'd still like to show off what what we've been doing over the past year. Um, we also want to hear about what you guys are working on and, and how we can kind of mesh together and how we can make this a more cohesive and dynamic uh, relationship. So any information that you guys have on how we can continue to build in the future is, is amazing and, and very helpful for us as well. Yep. TJ, as always, you're an excellent webinar co-participant. Thank you, Captain. Um, I appreciate all your guys' time. We ran a little bit over, but um, thank you for bearing with us. I really appreciate the time as always, and um, have a great rest of the day and the following weeks to come.